Don, you're muted. John, John, can you hear me? John, you're on mute. That I am. Ha, Hello again, so, everyone. Okay, thank you. All right, let me start over. First off, I want to thank Carl for reaching out on behalf of the Mountaineers to do this presentation. And secondly, I'm happy to see all of you here today to share with you my journey of climbing Washington State's second 100 highest peaks. I'll start with the four minute interactive presentation then I'll go into some of the highlights of climbing the second hundred highest. Afterward, I'll share a five minute video I put together for the four year long journey. A word of caution, you may experience a delay or lag during the interactive presentation because of the panning and zooming heavy content. Uh, the content is still there if you can get past that part. Um, I had initially prepared the presentation with a live audience in mind but I wasn't sure if the same experience would carry through with Zoom. So I apologize for the inconvenience. Just a little disclaimers. Um, we all know that climbing is dangerous, period, whether we climb solo or in a group setting. There is never any room for error, but as the Mountaineers, we all have the necessary skills and knowledge to take adequate safety measures to ensure a safe return. So let's dive right in. When we wake, hear the birds and see the sun Side by side our fears are done All the good times just begun Oh, we know what we have, let's hold on tight Found what we're looking for in life Crazy, but things are finally right With you and I, the future is bright
me just a minute here. Can you, see, can you see this? Yep, I see it. It's good. OK, great. I'll do a bit of shuffling with all these windows. Hello again, I'm John, and let me start by giving you a bit of background on myself. Uh, I enrolled in the Mountaineers course, basic climbing course in 2012. Then the following year, I went on to the intermediate climbing course from 2013 to 2016. And at that same time, I enrolled in the crack climbing course to feel more comfortable on rocks. I volunteered a bit through the years and I'm currently an active member, but it's been a while since I've been on any Mountaineers trips. Some of you may know me by my trail handle, One Hike A Week, the face behind the onehikeaweek.com blog, where I chronicle my journeys as well as rants and rambles. I'm a hiker at heart, and I enjoy anything from short hikes to challenging climbs. The board your list prompted me to sign up for the basic climbing course, knowing nothing about technical climbing or a glacial traverse. I knew I needed the essential alpine skills if I ever wanted to finish the list. Luckily, at the time, my small instructional group leader, Jan Abenrat, um, who some of you may know, was very supportive of our group and gave us many opportunities, to, many opportunities to experience different types of climbs with him. And the skills and knowledge I've acquired through the course have then prepared me to tackle more challenging climbs on the list. And another reason for joining the Mountaineers was to connect with people interested in the obscure peaks, but generally I found a lack of interest as most folks had focused on climbing the classics. And so I ended up tackling most peaks on the list alone. For people who aren't familiar with the Bolger list, it's a Washington's 100 highest peaks extending from Mount Rainier to Floor Mountain. John Lixfer and John Plimpton created the list first using select, a selection of criteria based on three rules governing a peak's eligibility. Rule number one, an individual summit has to rise at least 400 feet above the surrounding terrain. The term 400 feet simply means 400 feet or greater clean prominence. And because of its old elevation of 8301, Mount Ballard did not make it onto the list. And rule number two, a peak with an official USGS approved name will be considered for inclusion even if it fails the 400 foot rule. In turn, the rules added these seven peaks. Um, if any of you climb who's working on the Bulger list or has um, finished the Bulger list, you see these um, Seven names, seven peaks are pretty popular, pretty um, well known among the climbing community. Um, so the rules added the seven peaks, seven finger jack, uh, Sahali, dark, Ron, horseshoe, little Annapurna, and black cap. And they all have under 40, 400 feet of strict prominence. And rule number three, an 800 foot rule applies to the prime of the volcano. So this is where I think I locked up because with the 800 um, foot rule, that means that I didn't have to climb any of the sub volcanoes, right? I only had to focus on Baker of just the five major volcanoes in the Washington state. Didn't have to think about the sub peaks. Um, so Mount Rainier and Mount Baker, uh, the four sub peaks would need to come off the list. And they are Liberty Cap, Sherman Peak, Colfax Peak and Lincoln Peak. 
I'm sure you might recognize some of these names. So to sum it up, uh, the Borgelist eliminated Luna and Castle by combining um, these rules. Now you're looking at climbing flora as the lowest at 8320 or touch and peak of the same height. And now for the top 100 list, there's only one rule. And that is the 400 foot prominence uh, individual. Every single peak needs to hold 400 feet or a greater clean prominence without exceptions. So based on the Boulder list, if we remove the seven peaks that don't qualify the 400 prominence rule and add back the four volcano peaks plus Ballard, that's five. That leaves us with two spots at the bottom um, of, the, of the list. And remember two peaks that got pushed off the Boulder list because of these three rules. Does anyone know which two peaks those are? Oh, you can hear it. That's fine. Um, they're Luna and Castle. And now we have a complete list with Mount Rainier holding onto her throne and Castle Peak at the bottom at a whopping 8306. Now onto the second hundred. Before we go on, I want to distinguish between the term T200 and the second hundred highest. T200 simply means Washington State's 200 highest peaks. The second hundred, the second hundred highest is just the name as the name implies. But in recent years, uh, T200 has become synonymous with the second hundred highest peaks, but shouldn't be. Again, the only rule that governs this list is the 400 foot prominence. Uh, since no complicated rules govern, this list is pretty straightforward. Like the top 100 peaks, every peak holds 400 feet or greater clean prominence. And then the list now puts Andrew Peak as the highest at 8301 after Castle and Mount Burge at the bottom at 7948. So you're looking at a 350 feet difference between the highest and the lowest. So then there's the Boulder bonus, but you're probably thinking, well, you said there's only one rule, right? That governs the second, the second hundred highest. Well, yes, they, there aren't other criteria other than the 10 optional peaks handpicked by the Boulder folks. You know, they always want to do something different. They have, want to have their own rules. Um, so they either have a USGS approved or they have an uh, approved name or under 400 feet of prominence. I want to emphasize that these unranked peaks are optional and you can complete this actual second hundred list without ever climbing these. But since my predecessors, Faye Poland and Eric Eames, if you know these, two big names in the climbing community. Um, they finished a, a list or two. Uh, they've been on all, all of the peaks. So the second hundred plus the seven from the top 100 plus these 10. So it was tough for me not to go after them as well. You know how it is when it comes to peak bagging, right? Now with these additional peaks, you're looking to do three more in the pickets. You're looking to do three more in the pickets, uh, two more in Poseidon Wilderness, including one just north of the boulder, uh, the border in Canada. Has anyone ventured into the picket? It's uh, time consuming to go from one place to the, ne the next for sure, if you've been inside. Sometimes it can take up to a day to just go from point A to point B even without climbing anything. So now we're looking at Degenhardt in the Southern Pickets, uh, Challenger West and Phantom Peak in the Northern Pickets that are three of the 10 optional peaks. And we're looking at two in Poseidon Wilderness. Actually Armstrong is in Canada, but it's part of the Armstrong Mountain Massive. So uh, the shorter high point is in Washington, but the actual high point is in Canada. Then we have the Pope on the west end of uh, over by Cathedral Pass, if you know where that is. Um, then we have five more that are in five different areas. We have Olgar on the Ptarmigan Traverse, Wildcat in Perseidon, Snowgrass in um, Alpine Lakes, 
Torment in North Cascades National Park and Mad Eagle North, North, uh, by the Canadian border. So I'm sure you're quite clear on how, the, how these lists all work together. Um, you know, essentially these are just, um, if you look at them, they're just bumps on the ridge, you know, with or without a list. And now onto the meat of the presentation um, that actually reminded me of something that Paul Klink once said in his descriptions of Azure, Azurite Peak, another you know, boulder. This notch provides an overlook to the meat of the mountain and the final traverse to its base where the correct gully awaits your foothold. Pretty reassuring, isn't it? So if you ever do decide to tackle the second 100 highest peaks, here are some key highlights. You can expect to spend most of your time in Poseidon Wilderness and Glacier Peak Wilderness. And then you get to climb one Olympic mountain and finally experience the rugged and awe-inspiring picket range firsthand. Here's some photos. Olympus and Luna Peak. And Luna Peak is an outlier of the northern pickets. It's the only spot in the northern picket that where you can actually see the rest, the other two ranges, both the southern on the left and the northern on the right. And the only place to actually get this panoramic view without obstruction is by being on the false summit. Because on the true summit, the false peak actually obstructs your view a little bit so you don't get the actual full view of all the peaks combined. Then there's Mount Terror taken from, this, uh, from Mount Terror, Terror of the, um, the west wing or the east wing of the south, southern pickets. And if you enjoy our pristine North Cascades National Park that harbors Stephen Mather Wilderness, you'll spend one fifth of your time there as well. And that wilderness accounts, to, accounts for 20% of the total trips. Um, and we have places like Mount Torment, Devil's Tongue, up by the Canadian border, up by the Chilliwacks, if you know where that is, and also West Fury. Another one. And most of your climbs will, will consist of class three and exposed terrain with a handful of hikes and one ice climb. Guess which one that is? Uh, when I say hikes, I mean that there's a trail that goes from your car to the summit. Anything in between is a scramble, right? So here's some uh, more challenging climbs um, that you'll enjoy. Uh, Johannesburg in above Cascade Pass. We have Hosami Mountain South, the sub-peak of Hosami Mountain up by the Canadian border. Then we have Mad Eagle Peak up by the Chilliwack. As a matter of fact, you're looking at Mount Redoubt right there head on when you get up, when you get to the top of the peak. For Cody and me, we enjoyed more scrambles and multi-peak trips during the first year, first two years with more uh, classic, uh, class three climbs. Um, being unemployed in 2018, I uh, had also contributed to the highest number during the second year at 39 peaks that season. Uh, then I tackled the challenging peaks in the latter two years, as you can see, Cody's numbers has gone down uh, during that time. Oh, I think I forgot to mention in the beginning, Cody's my, uh, my yellow lab. I think I skipped that in my introduction. An overview of how we spent our time and resources during the, those four years. We made 76 trips with 27,000 miles driven to the trailhead. I went through Cascade, uh, Canada four times. But Cody had to skip Hosami Mountain's South Peak because of the technicality. I had the pleasure of climbing with uh, 10 partners on 13 peaks, 11 if you include Cody. Um, when Cody couldn't go with me on any of my trips, he would stay at the doggy daycare and sit martinis. 
And of course, there's plenty of visits, right? trips to Starbucks and Walmart parking lots. With the second hundred highest, you continue to experience different and even more remote parts of Washington state, plus the diverse terrain and vegetation types. So instead of taking the evening going over every peak we've climbed, I will talk about the journey holistically for the, this presentation. And to keep my talk concise and on point, I will highlight some of the trips that I truly enjoyed and many, many I found rewarding. So after the Bolger list, I had thought about finishing the actual top 100 slash 400 foot prominence list. And that's all I wanted to do. I didn't have any plans for anything else other than checking off some random peaks on my back list. Then between 2011 and 2016, I had unknowingly climbed a few second hundred highest peaks while working on the Bolger list. And I ended up getting 11 of them. Um, I climbed eight mile after seeing photos of the hiking duo Ragman and Rodman's report, uh, climbed Mount Hardy for the views after seeing someone else's report. And for Ballad, I actually climbed it by mistake when I was using the book Summit Route by Steven, Stevenson and Bongiovanni. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that book. Somehow he had group Azurite and Ballard as a slam, uh, as a group to climb. And um, yeah, so I climbed Ballard, didn't get to Azurite because the whole basin was pretty brushy. Then Gray Peak, uh, I realized af after looking at the second hundred highest list, why some parties included that peak when they climbed Star, Peak, Courtney, and Oval. Um, glad that we had climbed it during that trip as well. And Apex Mountain climbed it with the Cathedral Group, Cathedral Peak. Um, the theater and a um, couple of other peaks um, in the area. That mountain, um, it would have been a pity not to climb it as you would have to go through over the ridge line to get to Ptarmigan. I mean, unless you want to go around the peak, then you would be missing out on the second hundred highest. The Luna, because the name actually sounded um, exotic at the time, you know, because in Latin means moon. And I also wanted to see the pickets for the first time. Then there's Castle, it was remote. Um, it would also satisfy the top 100 list. Macmillan, oh, good old Macmillan. The Spire was the turning point for me. Uh, I had bumped into Eric Eames, the name that I mentioned earlier. Uh, he also finished the Boulder list a couple of years before me. He climbed Macmillan Spire in a day. No, that's epic. Um, he's always been inspiring and I've always, I've looked up to him over the years on some of the climbs that he's done. Um, a prolific climber to say the least. Um, so we bumped into each other on, on our way to camp. And um, he said what I was going to do after, after finishing the Boulder list. And I said, I had no idea. I just wanted to have fun with my back burner lists my background of peaks. And then he told me about him going after the second hundred at the time and conveniently pointed to the spire behind him and said, hey, that one's on the list. Hence began my new goal to the second hundred. There's Eric. He was the number three uh, top 200 peaks finisher the year before me. Sorry. <laughs> and as Cody was aging, I believe he was eight at the time when we started, I wanted to start our journey with the low key climbs. Then I would have the more challenging peaks for later so he could stay behind. In 2017, we started by visiting Lake Chelan Sawtooth Wilderness early in the season to avoid the brush by being on the snow. From my experience with Bulger Peaks, I knew that the mountains in this wilderness were at most exposed to class three, which were suitable for Cody. And they would 
also be more enjoyable with far less type two work. And since he's been on all of the boulder peaks in this area, in this wilderness, I was confident that he could take on most, if not all, of the second hundred highest peaks here as well. My goal was to finish everything in the wilderness this year before moving on to another location. Um, but our plans may change depending on the wildfire season or unexpected elements. Uh, later, we went into Poseidon Wilderness, my favorite wilderness for the open terrain and the ease of navigation. There's usually a decent trail to follow as well. So in 2017, we started by, um, let's see. There's a story behind Conrad Meadows. So the story behind Conrad, driving from Conrad Meadow, which is where um, you're familiar with the second hundred peaks list, it's um, Gilbert Peak in the Gold Rocks Wilderness. Uh, it was the year that the road closure before Conrad Meadow kept us from climbing Gilbert Peak in a day. That was the goal to climb it in the day. Of course, I didn't check the fork the Forest Service website beforehand. So we left Gold, Gold Rock Wilderness at 11 p.m. without a sound backup plan. And then after checking my list of things that I could potentially do with Cody, we drove up to Freeze Out Ridge north of Winter to climb Tiffany Mountain and, and the nearby peaks. That's a long way to drive. Northern Pika Traverse. It was an exciting trip, of course, uh, but I wasn't too crazy about have, hauling nine days of supplies up to Eiley Wiley Ridge. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with that terrain and that traverse. Um, but starting on day three until the final day, we were climbing in the smoke during the day. At night, it would clear up mostly. We followed Jim Brisbane, who goes by Trailcat Jim. Uh, he has a blog as well. Route, we followed his descriptions and climbed Mount Challenger, Phantom Peak, and Krokathon Peak. I can't imagine making that same approach again for Phantom Peak had we missed it because I did not know that it was one of the optional peaks. Um, I would not have made that journey back there to just climb that one peak. And if you've ever been inside the pickets, it can take a long time to go from point A to point B without even climbing anything, right? And I'm glad we wanted a leisurely trip and had nine days to spare. Such a hidden gem of the Cascades. See, this is your basic scramble route, everybody. Would you just take a look at this? A reverse zipper. It doesn't go up, it goes down.
There was a lot of smoke in Poseidon that year, uh, 2017. Uh, the same amount of smoke that we experienced in the pickets continued through September. So we were in the fume during most of our trip. The evenings were clear, however, and the photo was taken from Freeze Out Ridge while climbing Tiffany Mountain and the surrounding peaks. And there's another photo taken in Poseidon um, while we were climbing Bowman Ridge. Um, it was crazy. I can't even, I, we were there. I mean, the whole time it was like this, except at night, it was clear. Um, we've probably inhaled more smoke from that trip than any of the previous trips combined. Then in 2018, we climbed 30. Nine peaks this season started with McLeod Mountain and finished with Cloud Home Peak. Um, then there's also climbed um, the Fisher Group, which is uh, Fisher. Oh boy, what are the names? Um, so there's Fisher Peak, uh, there's Greybeard, and there's um, a couple others in the, in the area. It's been a while, um, they all the names. Come on, there's a hundred of them, right? Um, <clears throat> then I thought it was terrible in 27 with our picket trip with all that smoke, but it was worse this year up north with the Canadian smoke. And it was during this time that um, if any of you has ever lost a beloved pet with whom you've shared many outdoor adventures, um, so two days before, Cody and I climbed the Piqua and Mount Birch by Clark Mountain, I believe. Um, my late Black Lab Cooper, whom we saw at the beginning of the interactive presentation, died of kidney failure. On July 12th, he left us eight days before our 10th anniversary to Rattlesnake Ledge, where we both started our very first hike together. Before his passing, um, his walking has slowed down significantly, but I had planned on taking him up to the ledge one last time with or without a stroller. But sadly, that never happened. And two days later, Cody and I set out for the trip to Napiqua and Mount Verge. So long story short, the trip to Napiqua was an emotional roller coaster, yet therapeutic at the same time, if that makes any sense. We climbed um, many trails group. There's many trails. He, it's kind of funny, the name. It says many trails, but there's not even one to follow. There's not a, an actual path that you can take to get to the top of the peak. I don't know where it got its name from. Then there's also Johnny Peak and Three Pinnacles that we climbed on that trip. And here's the um, photo that I took on day one and day four. So we went into Poseidon in late September. We entered, we arrived in the fall on day one and came out in the winter on day four. It was taken at the same spot three days later. It was crazy. We woke up on day four with a few inches of snow over our tent and I have a three season tent. So that did not work out well. In 2019, um, Climbed 22 peaks, um, opened with Gilbert Peak. It's actually quite enjoyable and scenic. I um, can't even think of a place in the South Cascades where you can get the view of the three volcanoes all at once, a panoramic view, um, just out of this world. And the weather cooperated, so we had a great time. 
But just as I thought I was well on my way to finishing the list earlier than expected, I learned about the 10 unranked peaks through talking to Milda. She's the person that organizes all the Boulder parties and events, if you know who she is. So the first thing I did was um, to figure out how I could, I could fit all these 10 more peaks into with all that I, that's left on my list with this minor setback. But of course, I was pretty annoyed because I could have combined several of these places with my previous trips to save me from having to make the same approach again. So also climb Mad Eagle, Snowgrass, and Wildcat. There's three, all except for Mount Olympus, are the unranked peaks. And here are some of the ones that I found quite rewarding that I climbed over that season. I think I did all of them solo. Yes. Uh, with the exception of Hozomin, the main summit, that I, Cody actually was able to make it up there with me. In Johannesburg Mountain, Hozomin South, an American border peak, such a beautiful peak in the winter. It's beautiful all year round, but with the dusting of snow, it's even, even more gorgeous. And the following year, 2020, um, I know 13 Peaks opened with Lincoln Peak. Um, I plan to finish my list this year. So with only 13 left on the list, I needed to pull out all the stops and bring out the rope guns. Then I also needed to take care of the six remaining unranked peaks, one of which is just past the border in Canada, and that's Armstrong. But since I also had the Pope on the list, I... Um, to take care of that, those two in one trip as well. The only thing was that they were on the opposite ends of the boundary trail. One's over by Cathedral Pass and the other one's over by Horseshoe Basin. And here's a list of all the peaks that I had to climb. And of course I, you know, as it always works out, I saved all the hard ones or the challenging ones for the end. Lincoln Peak was definitely a beast. Um, And Torment, if those of you who are familiar with the Torment um, Forbidden Traverse, it's part of that traverse. Then there's Challenger West, so which we could have combined with Challenger because it was right next door had I known about it. Then there's Degenhart, which I didn't find out until later also. I could have possibly climbed it with, with Mount Terror. Um, then there's Old Guard, that's actually unnamed with Sentinel next door. So Lincoln was my biggest concern, right? Um, it's infamous. Uh, and looking at folks who had gone after the list in years past, nearly everyone stopped at Lincoln Peak. I usually take people's words with a grain of salt, but believe everything that past climbers have told you about this black butte of Mount Baker. Sadly, at this time, only one person, the only person who wanted to team up with me had left us at the end of 2020. I had just met Jake Robinson in person during Bulger's party in 2019. And we briefly talked about the peak and how he was eager to climb it. But when 2020 came around and he and I hadn't done anything together before, I did not think it was a good idea to climb Lincoln Peak as our first climb together. Then it started to worry me when May came around and this is not the peak that anyone was messed with when the te temperature is high, when it gets too warm, um, it's not the place to be. But unfortunately, so May was a little cooler. Um, I started um, asking around again, and the few people I had talked to, no one wanted to touch it. And I was climbing, the I was this close to climbing a solo until Anne, with whom I had gone on a few type two trips in the past, agreed to come with me.
views were phenomenal. But the summit was a little narrow. Couldn't really see two people comfortably or safely for that matter. What's that? It was very echoey. Deep, you said? It was very echoey in that area. Because how close everything was, all these walls and head walls. And... Sure is. Watch out for debris. And there were a ton of tunnels to go through as well. Those are pretty deadly. Didn't know how, rebel, how deadly rebels were until I had to go over one of them. After I was through with Lincoln Peak, the rest seemed like a walk in the park in comparison. Then I enlisted Patrick uh, to climb Gunsight Peak and Agnes Mountain. He and I have climbed Dome and Sinister, uh, as well as a couple other Boulder Peaks in the past. I was very grateful that he took four days away from his significant other plus two babies to go on this trip with me. Then I also climbed, climbed Sentinel and Old Garvia. Uh, Termigan Traverse. There were no views on the summit. It was just pure clouds. Then I climbed the needles. I actually climbed the needles earlier in the season with Chandler Abelak, whom I met through Instagram a couple years before. And he had reached out to me, and so we ended up climbing three peaks together, including Big Kangaroo. So that's a brief overview of all the climbs. I tried to cram everything all four years into one small presentation, and hopefully that gives you a good idea of what uh, to tackle, you know, if you ever choose to uh, to work on the list, it's a fun list, you know, for the fact that I love, I liked it very much, even more so than the Boulder list, was because of the lack of humans. I think I might have run into Eric actually um, as he was going to the Fourth of July Basin up by Tufts and Peak, climbing White North. Um, other than that, I don't think I've run into any other anyone else on the on any of these these peaks because most of them are still pretty obscure. Um, it was nice uh, to just be able to enjoy all the solitude with the dog. Um, I felt like I was in heaven. So, as I mentioned earlier, I'm the person behind One Hike a Week blog, and at onehikeweek.com, shameless plugging. Um, <laughs> so my goal for the blog was um, to establish meaningful connections through information sharing. Many people have reached out for route information and GPS tracks over the years. I have never turned anyone away and can always make referrals if I didn't have the information available. And I want to promote transparency, diversity, and inclusiveness. I created the site with the intent to document my journey. I'm not one to exaggerate or sugarcoat my experiences. What you see is what you get. And as a person of color and a member of the LGBTQ community, I aim to embrace all people who need support being part of the outdoors community. Let us not forget, we all had to start somewhere and no one is above or below anyone else in the outdoors. We're all equal. And I also want to foster a mansplaining free and bra free safe space for brown people. The blog is my journal and random thoughts and isn't an online forum for debates. So I expect people to take everything on the website with a grain of salt and do their own research. Last but not least, I 
aim to continue the one hike a week tradition. Hiking once a week has always been at the core of what I do. As I mentioned, I'm a hiker at heart. So climbing obscure and challenging peaks along the way is only the icing on the cake. And I'm now into year 12 of hiking once a week. So you know, if you think about it, it's like brushing your teeth, right? Unless you don't brush your teeth every day. <laughs> That's how I look at it. And here are some of my takeaways, um, things I've learned along, along the way. Stay grateful. I count my blessings with every trip, uh, knowing everyone has them, knows not everyone has the means to do what we consider fun or epic. Like I'm supporting two dogs, I'm too broke to climb, right? I wanna stay humble. Being the loudest voice doesn't make me prolific. Uh, it just makes me noisy. I can brag myself, brag about myself all day long when I brag and no one has to read about it, right? I wanna stay focused and you know, knowing why I do and what I do to ensure a long-term fulfillment. And I take everything with a grain of salt and trust my instinct. I continue to stay positive. Make sac making sacrifices along the way is necessary. You know, even had to cancel my Friday night dates to sleep at the trailhead. Now that's sacrifice, right? And stay true. Come what may in the outdoors, I'll always have these hiking photos as a reminder that um, we all had to start somewhere and we all will get there. Two photos from my first two hikes that I did. Uh, there was a two month gap there because I was not into it after Mount Rattlesnake Ledge. Didn't know if I'd ever go back. And there we were two months later in September in 2008, my late black lab and I went up to Granite Mountain in the rain, no views. And most importantly, staying safe. Last but not least, um, it takes a village to do what we do. It's not just you going from your house to the summit. It, there's a, there are a lot of people that are involved. Um, I count my blessings and thank those who have lent a helping hand to continue my love for the mountains. Even though I only got to climb with a handful of you on a dozen peaks, I'm glad you were all there to share the experiences. There's some climbs, the only climbs that I had partnered on. Um, so these are all my 11, 10 partners. So Patrick and I, that was taken on uh, site, and Dave Goliath and Ann Brink, who's also in um, the other photo, uh, the middle photo with David, that's um, Kuka Thumb. That's why he's doing that Kuka Thumb gesture. And then I, with Eileen and Ann, we were on, that was on um, McMillan's fires. Views weren't great, but you know, if it weren't horrible, we could see Still see Pete's back there. And um, climbed the Olympus with Sean, Matthias, Paul Pittman, and Anand Minaya. Um, it was a long trip, but it was definitely rewarding. And again, Chandler and I climbed those on the, on the summit of the Needles. Like I said, that was one of my final climbs, so I had to pull out, pull out all the stops and bring out all the rope guns. So he was my rope gun. Um, then there's um, Colfax in Sherman that I climbed with Lindsay Warren, who was the youngest Bulger finisher at the time, back in 2014, I want to say, and then Duncan Smith. So all my climbing partners for the second hundred highest. Then there's this guy the one who I never thought would do most of the type two and crazy stuff we do over the years. I certainly have under, underestimated his ability in the beginning, but he's certainly proved, him, proved me wrong on many occasions. So here's to another 12 years, Mr. Cody. And that's him on the, on the left, on the summit of Mad Eagle, one of the unranked peaks, and then the summit of um, Hosami. And across the way, that's Hosen and South Peak. It's another one that's on the second hundred highest list. And then there are other people I need to thank. Trip reporters, climbers, climbing partners, pet sitters, and everyone else who I've forgotten. I know there's 
others I've left out, but you know who you are and I thank you. And that's the end of this portion. And I will now show a video that I put together for the Boulder Party and a couple other events. Um, let's see. Yeah. What's the best way to share? I actually didn't think about the best way to share a YouTube video. Carl? Hey, John, maybe just open a browser and point, point it to your YouTube video and, and just share your screen. Oh, the same way I did. Okay. Let's try that. So, can you see this or no? Not yet. Go back to you the see my share. Sharing. You see my share. I mean, you I'm, see it now, right? Yeah, I think we see it now. I think okay, it's coming up.
That's all. Excellent. Thank you, John. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, and congratulations on, on, a, on a huge accomplishment. Um, shall we proceed with a, with a Q&A? Does that sound good? Um, there are some, some questions appearing in, in the chat. So yeah, if anyone would like to ask a question, it's probably easiest to just uh, type it into the, uh, the chat window and, and I'll make sure that we address it. So um, Robert asks, what you, was your uh, fitness plan? And what did you do during the week? If you did, and if you didn't climb on a particular weekend, what training did you do? I don't really have a specific regimen. I, um, so I hike every week. And during the week, I actually go to a fitness gym, do my resistance training. Other than that, I don't really do anything. You know, I'm not one of those people that, you know, I don't have to, I don't run really. And I don't ski. I just snowshoe in the winter. Um, other than that, just the weekly outing. Um, that's, that's about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sure hiking every weekend will. <laughs> that's my excuse days. not to. That's my excuse not to do any other exercise. Yeah, good. that's a good excuse. Um, Robert also asks, do you think any graduate of the intermediate course could do this? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, you know, if you, on those challenging peaks, just if you have a partner that you can team up with, definitely I would recommend it. Um, there's some that I climbed solo, which I would not recommend to anyone just because it's, you know, the only thing that goes through my head when I'm climbing peaks like Hosamin South Peak um, or Mount Tormund was that <clears throat> if I were going to get back to my dogs. <laughs> With every move, every hold that I'm holding on to, everything that I'm touching, this is going to be the last time that you know, I'm going to see my dogs or will they ever see me. That's really the only thing that goes through my head while I'm climbing and like doing these classified moves. Um, I'm sure you know. People with kids, you know, definitely, you know, family is the first thing you think about. So, yeah, um, with the proper gear, I mean, you, you know, even as a basic student, I mean, once you've learned, gotten all the skills and knowledge that you, that you need, you just need someone to be able to lead you if you can't lead on road. Um, just have a, good, a sound plan and make sure that you have a, an exit strategy um, on any of those climbing, the challenging ones. Again, um, I think it was over 60, like over like 60 percent that's class three or 70, I can't remember. There's a lot of class three peaks on the on this list. So a lot of scrambles. I mean, if you scramble, you know, you can definitely do most of these. Um, it's mostly the 13 peaks that I saved for the end because I wanted Cody to <clears throat> to just sit out the entire season until the very last, the final two peaks, uh, which were the Pope and Armstrong. The, that were walk-ups that I wanted him to come with me as a as a way for us to finish what we started. Um, yeah, so the rest of the peaks were, you know, those are really the challenging ones. I mean, the ones before that, the years before, they were mostly scrambles and, you know, class four or low class fifth, you know. Mm -hmm. kind of most. So um, so Cody, Cody makes it up to the summits of, of all of these class three peaks and below, is that right? Yeah. Pretty much? Um, yeah, he just, if I knew he couldn't make any of the, the challenging ones in the class five, obviously. <laughs> if I had to use a rope, then he's not coming. Um, so, Did you ever yeah, have he, any I close just, calls with, with your dog on a class three P? No, that's one thing I actually should have mentioned. Um, we've been fortunate to, lucky, not to have any, any significant injuries or anything. I mean, other than sore paws and, you know, sometimes, you know, maybe sc sprain my, you know, because I, I have bunions, right? And those are painful in um, those stiff boots. Um, but other than that, I mean, like I said, I count my blessings every day, you know, for every trip, every time I make it home, like, okay, thank God, you know, now I've got to go out and do it again. <laughs> um, no, there's, you know, luck lucky for us, nothing, nothing bad ever happened. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of, a lot of, lots of messages of, of, of thanks and, and, and some condolences and so on in the chat. So I would encourage you to go through those as well. Um, and I'm just, 
Oh, okay. So here's a question. Um, yeah, I think there's also a lot, lots of fellow uh, uh, dog owners on the on the call tonight. Uh, but so Jeff asks, how many how many of the list did your dog join you? And uh, which I think you kind of just addressed. And uh, but also, what's the highest peak your your dog climbed? I oh my gosh, I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> it's been a while since we've done the Bulger. Um, what's the yeah, I don't, I mean, just all, I, 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 can't re, I can't recall off the top of my head. Oh, actually, um, I will yeah, have another question. I can't answer that. I can actually have that information somewhere. Well, were the dogs able to go on the volcanoes? I mean, I, sometimes when they're in a national park, the dog can't go, right? So. Yes, and uh, <laughs> I do have to admit, I'm taking him on three trips into the national park. So, you know, um, actually I had someone email me about that one time. And um, so I just kind of let it go. <laughs> you know, I mean, we all just, we're adults, we make our own decisions. And um, if, um, you know, and I did actually run into Eric, actually, he was coming down um, Triconi and I was going up. And uh, he met my dog, and I told him that he didn't see any, see any dogs there. <laughs> and also, Luna Peak was another one I took him on, but he stayed behind. And he's actually very good about gauging exposure. He gauging exposure. He knows when to just not try to go any farther. So I was surprised with you know the the fact that he actually got onto Hosamine, that he was hesitant hesitant to go down the false summit of uh, Luna, which I thought. It was about the same exposure. And yeah, he did actually do that, the class four step to go up, up to uh, Hosemi, which took me, took me by surprise. Mm -hmm. Were there moments where you got close to a summit and then the dog had to wait for a few minutes while you kind of tagged it and came back because the last little bit was too steep or? Yeah, so so with the Boulder Peaks, he, had, he waited for me. Um, so Tufshin, Devor. Those were definitely technical. And Devor has a, I think it's a class four step below the top where he just he just stayed back and uh, he knew he couldn't go on. So I had no problem. Like he would just relax, you know, either play in the snow or he would just sleep or chill. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure, you know, as a dog owner, there's many dog owners out there know that, you know, that's what dogs do. Mm -hmm. When they're unattended, they just, you know, fall, they just sleep. They love to sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Carol asks, what kind of harness the dog was wearing? No hard. Oh, uh, he has uh, just the the rough wear harness because um, I want to be able to. Because there's certain places where he's actually he can down climb, but if it's a too tall of a step that he can't get up, then I can I can just lift him up, knowing that he's a he's he will be able to make it back down. So I think that harness with a handle on it, so you could just grab him if you had. To. Exactly. I think I think there's some dogs that are they're the opposite. Like they can't come down. I mean, they can hop up, but then on the way down because things look differently as you as you know then um, they would get sketched out but with my dog Cody he's the other way around if he can't get up I'll just pull him up and then he'll, he he knows how to get back down so I mean I've been you know I'm lucky to have him I mean I never even I mean my other my first my black lab was like nine day compared to Cody he was not very agile and it was always like <clears throat> I always had a route find so Here's another thing I think most people don't understand is uh, climbing with dogs are not as simple as most people think. They think that, you know, your dog can protect you in the wild. They can, you know, it's easier, but it's not because you're, you know, when I take two dogs out, I'm route finding for three people, right? Because they always want to follow me, right? You know, as a dog owner, you know, they always want to follow you. So I have to find different ways, especially with two dogs at different levels have to find three different routes essentially for every trip if you know when it gets too sketchy so it's not it's not it's not as easy as people make it out to be and they can't protect you unless you've trained them to protect you um right i mean most dogs are even the, the basic commands i mean mind them mind them they just know they just know eat you know <laughs> and sit <laughs> yeah. but unless you've actually trained your dogs to protect you or to to you know to defend you 
they're not going to do you any good in the, in the wilderness. I mean, they're just going to be as vulnerable as you are. Mm-hmm. So that's a common mis- misconception that I've gotten over the years. They're like, oh yeah, your dogs are you know, they're going to fight off the bears. No, they're either more Probably curious. Or- the animals you don't want. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like they will not fight off bears. You know, it's like, <laughs> or, if any, or well, they'll be very curious about bears. Um, but neither is, is, a, is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see, Robert, Robert asks, what are you going to do next? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea, honestly, I'm just, um, I mean, whatever, I don't want to, I don't want to be tied to another list again. I mean, I knew this list was going to take me at least four years. I mean, with the way I planned it. Um, first of all, I did not, if I was going to, if I was climbing with a dog, I'm not going to try to be, because I know a lot, you know, uh, there are many places where I could have probably gotten like more, you know, like an extra peak, but because I had the dog with me, it's, I, I don't want to wear them out or I just wanted to, you know, I wanted our, this journey, because I think bold, with Boulder Peaks, it was just about getting it, getting it, getting it, getting it. But when I went into climbing the second hundred highest, I wanted something I wanted to be, I wanted to add an extra day when I could, where I could to make it more relaxing, more leisurely for the both of us. Um, I felt like I really wore him out with the Boulder Peaks because, you know, just peak after peak after peak. And, but with this one, I would add a day here and that would take Fridays off just to add an extra day. So we can have an extra day, like maybe offload some of the front load, some of the mileage, you know, um, on day one and then do the actual climbing on day two. But with Boulder Peaks, it was just, approach, climb, exit, you know, it's a lot of that. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to do that again. And it was just not, it was not fair to him. I mean, mm-hmm. He sacrifices his youth. I mean, he's now 12. Um, he started doing all this when he was six months. So, you know, I mean, he's, he's been around. So <laughs> and I want to make sure that he continues to, he can continue to go, go out with me um, for as long as he can. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Ellis asks, what's a good way to connect with other climbers? I, I would suggest starting with the mountaineers, but uh, do you have? Yeah, de- def- definitely. I, before I joined the mountaineers, I just reached out to random people that I saw in the forum that were posting trip reports. But I do have to say that um, not all of them gave me the time of the day um, because I was so green. I think I had, hadn't done a backpacking trip before I did. So my first backpacking trip was the, the big craggy, West craggy trip ever. Um, but prior to that, I had never backpacked before or camped overnight. Um, reached out to a few people, but no one actually got back to me. So yeah, I was a little worried. I was like, how am I ever going to finish this list? Mm. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Nathan, Nathan says, love the footage. What kind of camera and filming gear do you use? It's very basic. I've been using Canon since I started hiking. I um, actually started with Sony, but switched to Canon when I bought my first DSLR. Just it's a mid grade, the 90 in the 90 series, 90D, I think. Um, yeah, I don't really, I'm not a camera guy. I just, I just want to be able to take photos. That's all I care. You know? mm-hmm. And, um, and as, as much as I don't want to, I started taking my phone with me just because I, my camera has actually crapped out on me a couple of times. Um, <clears throat> just in case that ever happens again, I have my phone to take photos. I don't normally take pictures with my phone because I got tired of maintaining two sets of photos in two places. So I just keep everything. I just do all my film. Um, yeah. And I don't, you know, I use special lenses like um, the Nitty, the Nitty 50, 50 just something for the you know for the um the field depth of field um and i used to carry a zoom lens with me to capture those farther uh, distant mountains but i stopped doing that um i think i just got tired of carrying an extra lens um other than that and i just i'm really into shooting star trails especially on a clear night a starry night with the milky way um i just find it fa- find it fascinating um I'm not much of a video person, <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I just never really got into videos, but I actually have fun putting together this video, um, taking all the footage I've taken on Summit, because that's about the only video I'd ever shoot. It's just my panoramic view on every peak. Um, so I figured I might as well just string all of them together and see how it would turn out. Actually, 
actually like this. I mean, I'm not a, you know, there's definitely some learning curve to learn, you know, film editing, editing stuff. Yeah. Nothing special, just um, whatever I can take with me and that takes decent photos. Mm -hmm. Yep. Excellent. Uh, do you do you find you have to you um, spend a lot of time after a trip and putting together a trip report and, and sorting all the photos and everything or? Yes, and that's why I'm constantly behind and I'm so behind. I have last year, I have so many unpublished trips. Mm -hmm. um, I think I did that at one point. I also started, I also um, started, decided to um, do school in the evening as well. Um, so I, in the fall, I didn't really have any time to go through all my summer photos. So I'm like, totally have a huge backlog um, as well as the ones from the year before. Um, yeah, definitely. It does take, you know, I mean, I, I would love to just be able to throw everything up and, but I've, you know, it's my, what, 12th year of hiking. I figured, you know, I did all that in the beginning, but I felt like at some point I had to do something to at least make it look, make things look pal palatable or things look more attractive, I guess, just so people would actually want to read it, you know? Um, so I think, you know, folk, Photography was always the first thing. It's like, as long as I have my photos, you know, then the blog came in 2010. Um, and from there, I, I mean, before I was using you know, Tumblr, I think, just threw everything up there. I didn't organize any of mine, didn't do any. My writing sucked and <laughs> it was like, it wasn't thinking, I was just rambling. It was a lot of rant, rants and rambles for sure. Then I decided, then people started reaching out and for information. And I thought, and I started looking at my old reports. I was like, oh my God, I can't even read this. So it's such, so poorly written. Uh, <laughs> then I decided to go into at least, you know, at least for the big, the more significant clients and more challenging clients, I decided to devote more time into writing things up and also um, editing my photos. Um, I could just do a photo dump, but I don't like to look at my photos just dump on the site anymore on, on, online anymore I actually want to go through them and just weed out the ones I don't need I, or I don't want people to see um yeah so I do you know I wish I had more time in the day to actually go through all my trip reports yeah I I, I call them I call them blog posts because I don't feel like I'm reporting to this particular you know particular audience because I, I want to and I also try to stay away from using a lot of technical jargon the climbing jargon, just because I want to broaden my readership. I have, I've had pe hikers actually met, you know, commented on my post saying that, you know, they were able to read it because they understood what they were reading. Yeah. So I try, I tend to avoid stuff like beta, you know, because most people aren't going to know what beta is unless, <laughs> unless they're a climber or a pre precipitous, you know, I try to stay away from all, just make it as common, as plain as, you know, as one-on-one as possible for most people. So, you know, because the climbers, I mean, they can read it and, I mean, they understand. I don't need to tell a climber beta. You know, it's like they already know what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, and I do find I do find that once I started doing that, because I look at the statistics on my on my blog, and you know, then I started getting more views, and I started getting more hits on Google. Um, starting, you know, people started discovering me via you know. Then I started paying more attention to um, op uh, optimizing my search results as well took all that into consideration because I want, I definitely want my, I want my content to rain, right? I mean, at the end of the day, what good is it if no one reads it, right? I mean, I have a blog out there. I mean, it's not just going to sit there. I want people to actually come and visit. If you, even if they, even if it shows up in their search results, they don't click it, I'm still getting an impression, right? So yeah. that tells me that, that I've been, I was found, like Google found me. Yeah. That's all that matters. So then, yeah. you know, like, it's always not, it's always good to hear people writing, you know about taking one of my posts and my track and being able to like some guy contacted me about Mount Fury. Um, you know, I'm always willing to share. I mean, the tracks are just gonna sit around collecting dust anyway. Why not just share it? So I that's one thing I you know didn't mention in my in my presentation is that all these gatekeepers in the community, I don't I don't get it. Like my blog is very transparent. Like I will tell you where I went, where I started. There's no reason for me to keep any of that information from you. I mean, who am I, right? I mean, I'm just another person who enjoys the outdoors. So I want others to be able to have that same experience and be able to, if I can get myself out there, I want to see other, 
other people succeed and want to see other people make it make it up there mm -hmm. um I was never the first summit and I will never be the last. So there's no point in me trying to withhold any information. I mean, I can tell you what to do. I will share all the information I have with you. But at the end of the day, you decide what you want to do with it. I can't tell you what to do. I can't tell you what not to climb. I mean, you know, no, you know, I don't want you to tell me what not to climb. Um, I give you all the information and, you know, then I'll leave it up to you. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think that's the best any of us can do. So, and I definitely, you know, I've seen enough, enough gatekeepers around that I just never want to be one of them. Yeah. Um, so Kat asks, what's your favorite climb? Probably not an easy question to answer. <laughs> um, if you can pick one out of, maybe out of that second hundred, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I think just any, any peak that Cody, anything that's, you know, ch challenging and Cody was able to be there with me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, those were definitely the most rewarding climbs. Um, <clears throat> I will probably talk about Jose in the years to come just because, you know, <clears throat> I mean, such a beautiful place and with him being up there and you know, such, in such a gnarly terrain, um, so sketchy, especially, you know, for our four-legged fur friends. Um, but, you know, just places that he's able so. Mad Eagle was another one that I liked. Um, it's one of the photos that I featured in my presentation um, that he was there as well. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, just places I can, I actually got to ex share the experience with him. Do you, do you have a list uh, of climbs that you did with Cody on your on your one hike a week or somewhere? Oh, I know, which, you reminds me, which, which, no, which, which reminds me, like, I have not updated their blog because they are their, they have their own blog. Uh, oh, of course. Like, dogsonhikes.com. Um, Dogs on hikes. Okay. Dot com. Yeah, I do. So for the second hundred. It looked like about maybe 80% of them, but. Um, yeah, so he, he did 82, I think. 82. Um, yeah. Okay. John, as I said, uh, there's lots of um, compliments and thanks in the chat here. So thank you everybody for um, for your input there. And um, if anyone has has a question, please please let me know now. Otherwise, I think we can probably wind it down. Um, if if anyone has an idea or a suggestion for a future uh, Beta and Bruce, then please uh, reach out to me and let me know if you'd like to present or if you think you know someone else who might make a good presenter who uh, has a, a great story. Um, John, thanks again. This, this was you know, really a pleasure to hear about uh, your, your adventure here with the top. I, I, yeah. I thought it was 200. I didn't know that you had to do 217 to get 200. But so, it's, so you were, you're only the fourth one to do the 217, is that right? I want to say fourth known. Finisher, fourth known, right? yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, there were those before us. I mean, who knows who's climbed, how many people has actually finished the boulders or the top 100? I mean, Fair enough. Knows? you know, um, in the recorded history, I guess. Yeah, yeah number four, uh, number four. Um, <clears throat> so Faye, you know, again, she's incredible. This lady, number 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 two finisher. Um, I've yeah, seen her I mean, in a few summit registers, yeah. Yeah, she's put, she's put up, especially on the second hundred highest, she's put up <laughs> like 90% of those summit registers. Yeah. Um, it's always, it's always comforting to see her names. So for some reason, I don't even know her. It's always comforting to see her, you know, knowing that she's been there um, before me. Um, definitely, you know, inspiring. Um, and the same with Eric. Eric Eames, he finished the list the year before I did. I think he's working. He's he's right now, right now. He's working on his um, the, the the 300 highest. What? <laughs> and you know, I mean, just because the list is getting shorter doesn't mean it's actually not getting. I mean, I have to say, the easiest climbs on the boulder list was probably the, the volcanoes, you know, after having finished. And now after the second hundred, you know, second hundred introduced a lot of those peaks that you just, they're like tucked away and they're um, kind of out of the way and just a pain to get to. Like, you know, the ones, especially up the ones up by the Canadian border where Sheep Mountain, right? Sheep Mountain, um, by the time you get there, you're 20 miles away from the trail end. You know, that's like one of the longest climbs um, versus Ptarmigan, right? Once, when you get to Ptarmigan's a Boulder List peak, 
once you get to Ptarmigan, you're 16 miles away from the trailhead, from Slate Pass. You know, it's, there's a lot of those. So there's a lot of just, just a long ways to just get to the bottom of things. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure most of you can relay, right? I mean, there's, but with the, somehow with the second hundred, I just felt like there was even more like places I didn't know exist or know existed or places I wish I had I had included some of these peaks when I was doing the Boulder Wood, but I was not thinking that far ahead. I was only so focused on um, Boulder Peaks at the time. So, but yeah, but Luna, Luna Castle, definitely the ones that got left out of the Boulder list. I mean, those are definitely worth checking out, even though I we had no views on the castle, but just on the surrounding peaks, like, because Hosami is right next to Castle. I mean, phenomenal view. So Castle, you know, if you ever want to tackle just the, the top, after after you finish the Bulger list, if you want to fit continue on with the top 100, you only have to do seven more, right? Um, <laughs> and try not to leave Lincoln for the very end. Yeah. <laughs> That's not good. Yeah. And or as a season opener. <laughs> and have a very good partner on it. Yeah. OK. Awesome. Again, thank you, John. Yeah, okay. no, thank you. Thank you for having me here. And thank you, everyone, for being here. It was great to be able to share my experience um, once again with um, a great crowd. <laughs>